Hello and welcome to a new season of Interpreting India. Geopolitical realignments, sustainable growth, healthcare financing, inclusive digital transformations, climate change, supply chain disruptions, urbanization, and several other critical global matters envelop the world as India holds the G20 presidency. We at Carnegie India continue to bring voices from India and around the world to examine the role of technology, the economy, and international security in shaping India's future. I'm your host, Kunak Bhandari, and this time, we're discussing India's space sector. In this episode of Interpreting India, we'll be taking a closer look at India's space sector and certain key developments. Certain questions will be asked to gauge a better understanding of the sector, such as, what does it take to set up a successful space company? What to make of the space reforms unveiled three years ago? And the recent ISET framework, which is the Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies, and how might this play out when it comes to space cooperation between India and the U.S.? Joining us today to discuss this topic is Dr. Sushmita Mohanty. Dr. Mohanty is a spaceship designer, entrepreneur, and space diplomat. A protege of the late science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, she seamlessly straddles the worlds of art, architecture, design, technology, and business. Sushmita is the only space entrepreneur in the world to have co-founded companies on three different continents. Earth to Orbit in Bangalore, India, Moonfront in San Francisco, U.S., and Liquid First Systems Group in Vienna, Europe. Her latest endeavor launched in October 2021 is India's first dedicated space think tank called Spaceport Sarabhai. Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, she worked for the International Space Station Program at Boeing in California and on shuttle Mir missions at the NASA Johnson Center in Houston. Sushmita is a new space expert. She advises investors and policy makers on matters related to the emerging new space economy. In 2019, Sushmita was elected as one of BBC's 100 Women Laureates Inspiring and Influencing a Female-Led Future. In 2012, she was voted into Financial Times' list of 25 Indians to watch. In 2016, she was nominated to the World Economic Forum Global Future Council for Space Technology. Dr. Mohanty, welcome to Interpreting India. Thank you, Kunak. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Mohanty, how did you get started in this industry? At a time when incubating a space startup would have been challenging due to the difficulties involved in securing financing, finding the right talent, as well as demonstrating a commercial use case for your product, how did you manage to succeed in this sector? I think that's a tricky question um, as far as I'm concerned, because I essentially got started with the world of space, not so much the industrial side of it, but the space exploration and utilization side of it. Um, because I was born into India's nascent space program, I was raised among the space pioneers um, in Ahmedabad in the early 70s when we incorporated ISRO formally as a space agency. My dad being part of the dream team that Sarabhai brought together to get going with his um, you know, space vision that he had for India. Professionally, I got... Uh, to become part of the industry in 1997 with my first stint at NASA Johnson in Houston. Um, I was there as a visiting scholar and I got to work on a number of design projects related to the upcoming International Space Station project. I also participated in ongoing experiments um, to develop protocols for the new station that was going to be built. And while being on NASA campus, we got to be test subjects for very many, um, you know, ongoing simulations and stuff. So I think NASA Houston was where I began my professional career, so to speak. Thereafter, I joined Boeing in Southern California in Huntington Beach, and I started working for the International Space Station program in 1998, in the summer, May of 1998. And my role in Boeing, because I was a foreign national, uh, I didn't have access to drawings. So I was hired into the International Business Development Group, which was called the International Programs Office. We were a small group of 12 people, I being the youngest, uh, that was making money for the space uh, station program as opposed to spending it. We were responsible for bid and proposal, for negotiating new contracts, and for managing international contracts. So that was a three-year stint with Boeing. And um, at the end of 
those three years, I got to a point where I thought, now that I've learned everything I need to learn in terms of, um, you know, sort of how the aerospace businesses are run, maybe it's time to move on and start my own little outfit in San Francisco. Back then, the word startup didn't exist. Uh, and my first company, Moonfront, was more of an experimental venture where we were six partners and we created what you would call a small boutique space consulting firm. Uh, the kind of projects we did through Moonfront were diverse. Um, everything from running uh, lunar-based design workshops um, for the European Space Agency to uh, putting NASA on Second Life, uh, teaching space design studios at some of the leading design schools in California. We even celebrated the millennium, the new millennium, and the movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, at uh, the Playboy Mansion grounds in Los Angeles. Um, so I think, I think the first company, being a first-generation entrepreneur, was where I learned what it takes to have your own um, space company. So Sushmita, that's, you know, a lot to start off with. Uh, but as we all know, you have set up three companies in three different continents. What was the transition? Uh, what was the next move after you set up Moonfront in, in San Francisco? What was the next step and how did you manage to make that transition? Um, so after I started Moonfront, um, so each of my ventures uh, were co-founded with friends of mine, either fellow alums of the International Space University or friends who I had had a chance to work with uh, in, in the space sector. So my second company, which I co-founded with an Austrian friend, was incorporated in Vienna in 2005, and it's called Liquifer Systems Group. This particular company, so each of my companies thereafter were created with a certain mission in mind. The Vienna company um, was our way of telling the NASA's and the European space agencies of the world that for the longest time, government agencies have taken an engineering-centric approach to designing human-rated systems, you know, habitats and so on. And this was, we were all in the new millennium, and we wanted to send a message that it's time to bring in the architects, industrial designers, and other uh, disciplines into the design process and make it a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so when we started the Vienna company, I, I can confidently say we were the first company in the world where architects, industrial designers, ergonomists, scientists, engineers collaborated on designing future systems. What I mean by future systems is um, habitation systems, transportation systems, exploration systems for exploring, you know, moon, Mars in the near future. And what do I mean by near future? We're looking at a time span of, say, a couple of decades from now. Um, so Vienna, the company was founded in 2005. We celebrated our 15th anniversary during the pandemic. And in Europe, all of these uh, design projects that we've undertaken over the years, whether it is through a ESA contract or through grant funding through the European Commission's Edge 2020, Horizon 2020 program, have been consortium efforts. What I mean by that is each of these design projects typically has a couple of small companies, sometimes a large company, a couple of research institutions, and a university thrown into the mix. Uh, so it's always team effort, and it's multicultural, multidisciplinary um, way of doing things. The Vienna company, we not only design space habitats and spacesuits and rovers and communication protocols between robots and astronauts, we also build prototypes, full-scale prototypes, and we test them in what we call analog environments, environments which mimic what you would find uh, in our future planetary destinations, such as the moon, Mars, um, and, and beyond. Um, after Vienna, um, I moved back to, so the Vienna company was something, um, I was integral to the company, but I would 
live in San Francisco and visit Vienna for several weeks at a time to work on projects. And then we would work remotely as a group as well. So in some ways, what many of us got to do uh, in terms of co-working remotely during the pandemic, we already started that method of working way back, you know, in, uh, in the early part of the millennium. So for us, it was a natural extension of how we worked then and then how we adapted to the pandemic. The India company, uh, the India venture was my third venture, and that was incorporated in 2008 when I left San Francisco and moved back to India. I remember uh, mentioning the move to Arthur Clark, who was one of my mentors. And this was in 2008. And I remember him saying that that's a strategic move. So I asked him, why do you think so, Arthur? And he said, well, everything began in the East and it's going back there. And he gave me the example of Chinese alchemists having invented gunpowder. And he said, no gunpowder, no rockets. So I think that was quite prophetic, if you ask me, and see where, for example, China is with its space program, having overtaken the United States in the number of launches per year, having landed on the moon successfully three consecutive times. And also, if you look at the way the Indian space program, which uh, began in the late 60s, uh, has now matured as a government program and is starting to make forays into the private uh, space sector. Sushmita, I just wanted to touch upon your, you know, move back to India and setting up Earth to Orbit. Uh, what, what, what prompted the move to come back to India at a time when perhaps the policy environment was not as fertile or as encouraging as it might be today? What was the reason behind the move? Uh, going abroad, uh, for me, was really not a big deal uh, the way it is for some of my other friends and, and, and peers, because I was sort of raised among the pioneers of the Indian space program who had themselves been in the United States, in Germany, in Canada, and had studied, you know, at various uh, places like Caltech, MIT, uh, German universities, what have you. So I think the timing of the move is, is I think, what is important. Uh, I was very clear that I wanted to become part of space programs of, you know, these other geographies like Europe, like the United States. I also got to work with the Japanese a little. Um, the reason I decided to move back to India around 2008 is I felt that given the exposure I'd had for almost, you could say, a little over a decade having worked with international partners in various capacities, I thought it was time for me to now go back to India and see how I could take or how I could contribute to take the Indian space program to the next level. What I mean by that is my dad's generation made India technology independent. Uh, we were a, a brand new republic uh, with a mission for what we wanted to do with our space program. And it took us a few decades to get to a point where we were making our own satellites, uh, making our own rockets, launching our own satellites, and had a fair degree of maturity in terms of how to use our space assets for, um, you know, for Earth applications, for improving the quality of life of our people. So I felt it was time for my generation to sort of take on the onus of taking India into what I would call the international space marketplace. Uh, despite having a very accomplished government space program, I felt it was India was missing on the international scene. Um, and now we know that as of today's numbers, the civilians, civilian part of the space industry, the revenues, annual global revenues are close to $400 billion. And my move to India was to find a way to trigger India's foray, so to speak, into this international space marketplace and make it part of that competitive landscape. All right. So you've moved back to India now, Sushmita, and uh, you know you sort of wanted to trigger, I guess, find a way to trigger uh, India's participation in the international space marketplace. If I can be blunt about this, how has that move, you know, gone in terms of not just your company, but also in terms of India's overall ecosystem. Do you think that void, which is there 
you know, as far as the private sector is concerned, have they sort of taken up the baton and managed to fill in that gap? So I think uh, blunt questions require blunt responses. And the blunt answer is um, not really, not yet. Um, so I think with Earth to Orbit, my third venture, we spent about seven years um, trying to see how we can make one of India's rockets, the PSLV, one of the most sought after rockets in its class in the international market. And in order to achieve that, we realized that the Europeans uh, approached India for launching their satellites through bilateral diplomatic relations because we have great bilateral relations with Europe. And what who were, I, I think the way we approached this um, the business case for making the PSLV a, a leading rocket in its class was that we would have to bring the Americans and the Japanese to launch on the PSLV. So my company um, sort of took that up as a first mission, and we launched a Japanese satellite in 2012. Um, the American um, engagement was far more tougher because the 1998 embargo still existed um, when we got started with the Earth to Orbit. And our first launch client was a Stanford startup called Skybox Imaging, which also happened to be the first space startup to have raised private capital in the Valley. And we decided to work with them to see if we could launch a Skybox satellite on the PSLV. That was a fairly long drawn out uh, diplomatic affair you could call it soft diplomacy, where Skybox engaged an ITAR attorney who um, did the rounds in Washington, D.C. And I personally met more than a dozen diplomats and bureaucrats, both in Delhi at the Ministry of External Affairs and in D.C. at the U.S. State Department and Trade Department. Uh, and finally, after nearly three years of conversations and discussions, we were given the first waiver or rather a TAA to enable the launch of a Skybox satellite on the PSLV. It took another year to get all the signatures in place. And in the fifth year, we finally signed a historic launch agreement between the marketing arm of the Indian Space Agency and our client Skybox. So it was, history was made. I mean, it was, uh, you could say for those of us who are familiar with the coming down the Berlin Wall in the early 90s, I would say we did bring down a mini Berlin Wall. In, in diplomatically speaking. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, India was ready for private enterprise to play uh, on an equal footing with the government agency, right? And for the last decade or more, after I moved back to India, I have had several meetings with our ministers, our bureaucrats in Delhi, about opening up the, U the Indian space economy, about liberalizing the Indian space economy. And I think finally in 2020, in, the June of, in June of 2020, when the government announced their intention, quote unquote, intention for reforms, um, many of us in the new space industry were, um, we welcomed that announcement. Um, I wouldn't use the word thrilled, because we were also cautious and we wanted to see how that proceeds. And perhaps as um, you might have noticed, given your involvement with the Indian space policy landscape, it took three years. I mean, it's going to be the third year since the announcement. It took almost 17 months to set up a board for the, uh, for the nodal agency that the government wanted to set up called InSpace. So InSpace is... Uh, supposed to serve both as a regulator and a promoter for the liberalization of India's private sector, which, if you ask me, in itself is a conflict of interest. Um, the regulator cannot be the promoter and vice versa. We, we know that the government intends to have four different directorates under InSpace, and currently only two of them are fully operational. So we are waiting for the other two to become fully operational. Um, the bottom line is that there is intent, but the government is moving extremely slowly to operationalize the reforms that it announced three years ago. Uh, there have been some developments. Um, if you look at recent developments, such as uh, they have set up a space systems design lab as part of the in-space uh, 
office in Ahmedabad. They have started giving access to test environmental test facilities to private companies in a somewhat more streamlined fashion. Uh, ISRO has announced uh, about 100 areas of research interest. But the thing that's really missing um, in this, in this uh, sort of new uh, initiative that the government um, has now undertaken to make the private sector become more prominent is there's no funding, really. If you compare the Indian uh, ecosystem with, say, a more developed space economy like the, like the United States or France, for that matter, we don't have enough funding for our new space companies. Um, so they have had to entirely rely on um, venture capital funds. And some of the more mature new space companies have been able to raise anywhere from $3 million to 11 million, and one of them has even raised nearly 60 million US dollars um, for their fledgling startups. So I think the government really needs to step up and understand that the space industry um, needs to have the government as a definitive anchor customer, whether it is uh, Bezos or Musk. Um, or whether it's old space companies like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, all of them. Um, they are where they are because of large government contracts, both from DOD and NASA. And India needs to also have a similar response in terms of making the DRDO and ISRO recurring anchor customers that give out large contracts to our private company. So that is far from happening. We are um, sort of championing um, the policy push that's necessary. We need a policy framework, which is also missing, if you ask me. We've had several policy documents, but we are yet to have a robust framework. Uh, and the other thing that's missing uh, is uh, space legislation in parliament. So unless that happens, let's say if a space company is building and launching rockets, which uh, which they are, what happens if, um, you know, one of the rockets falls on a, on a, on a third country? Uh, we don't even have clarity on things like um, third party liability and space insurance. So I think India has a long way to go in ensuring uh, the kind of environment one needs for private companies to thrive. But we've gotten started. I think at least we've taken the first step. That's a very wide ranging answer, which I think touches upon issues of procurement, ITAR regulation, and even funding. So I'll touch upon these issues one by one, Sushmita. And I'd like to start with the seed funding scheme recently announced by InSpace about two weeks ago, where they're basically going to dedicate about, you know, one crore rupee per space startup and basically, you know, show them the ropes and, you know, uh, basically give them funding to get off the ground. What do you make of this amount? What do you make of the scheme? Uh, do you think anything more could be done to augment the scheme, make it better? Have there been previous schemes in the past which have sort of been initiated and announced but might have not worked out? How would this be any different? So the recent announcement um, that you just outlined by InSpace is a modest first step. And in some ways, it is similar to the Small Business Innovation Research Funds um, that is available through NASA's SBIR program and the SDTR program. So if you look at one crore, in today's terms, uh, it's roughly $150,000. And I think $150,000 is a good amount of money for a startup to do what I would call technology demonstration um, or run a pilot study or two. So I think in that sense, it's a good first step. But if you look at the SBIR format, after phase one, which is the tech uh, feasibility demonstration phase, uh, NASA offers a fairly generous quantum of about half a million dollars or more for the company to go out and commercialize the technology. So I think if InSpace has finally taken that first step, they also need to follow through and come up with a phase two, which will allow the companies to sort of take the initial tech demo, uh, refine the technology, 
uh, run market studies, figure out their go-to-market strategy, and um, sign up their initial clients. So I think, uh, like like I said, it's a great first step, but there needs to be more. Uh, another thing I'd like to touch upon, Sushmita, is the issue of anchor customers. Now, you know, from what I understand, procurement is a really messy thing. I think not just in India, but in various countries across the world. But in India, it seems to be this focus on the L1 bidder, which sort of complicates things. Uh, is that all there is to it? Or are there other sort of, you know, uh, glitches in the system which could be sort of, you know, wrinkled out? So I I got introduced to India's procurement mechanism uh, somewhere around 2012. When I was consulting to one of the big Indian conglomerates, they had an aerospace subsidiary and they were working on international offsets, defense offsets. And I think the Indian procurement system uh, is still quite clunky, the way it's been designed. Yes, there have been refinements. um, But if you look at the way procurements are done, um, they are still sort uh, sort of last century, if you ask me. Um, we need to figure out how to not only streamline our procurements, um, and definitely this whole issue of L1, um, it it just doesn't seem to make sense, Uh, especially because we are talking about uh, critical technologies. We are talking about technologies um, that are vital to the nation's strategic interests, to the nation's security, and there is no way you can use an L1 Um, method of determining who your prime contractors will be. So I think that's that's just the tip of the iceberg, the L1 thing. I think we need to take a look at our procurement strategies, both in in terms of defense-related applications, but also in terms of civilian applications, and find a way to bring in best practices from other countries um, the other the other process that I find very cumbersome and lacking in in you could say uh, stamina and vigor is uh, the tendering process. So if you were to sign up for a NASA tendering process or a European Space Agency tendering process, the number of invitations to tender are frequent, and the format in which you have to respond to those tenders, in other words, how you write your proposal you know, the technical part of the proposal, the management part of the proposal, the budgetary part of the proposal, these are really uh, sort of designed in a manner um, that as a company, you can respond in a way which is uh, sort of comprehensive, thought through, easy to negotiate. So it's not just the procurement process in, in the way contracts are awarded, but also the way contracts are bidded for, you know, the, the entire competit- competition, the competitive bid process. I think, I think we have a lot to learn on that front. And um, how that's going to happen, that's something not only for the government, but also Department of Space and the industries to sort of put their heads together um, and, and overhaul the, the entire process if, if we are to compete internationally. Thank you for that, Tushmita. I think now moving on to the third part of your answer, which you gave a while back, which was negotiating, you know, ITAR restrictions or when you were dealing with Skybox imaging. Uh, do you think there has been a change in that process since you last worked on that issue? Or do you see the recent U.S.-India initiative on critical and emerging technology being a promising framework? By all means, you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not really something which has been in, you know, been here for too long. And I think the framework was only released at the sidelines of the Quad Summit last year. So there is still some progress to be made on that. But do you see a shift in how things are dealt with as far as the ITAR is concerned when it comes to dealing with Indian space companies? Yeah, I think before I respond to this question on ITAR, I wanted to add a little bit more to the previous response uh, regarding procurements. I think the other issue that is glaring uh, as in the face. And we, we, as in those of us who have worked in internationally, uh, find it quite disturbing is conflict of interest when it comes to procurements. So you might have heard uh, that the Indian Army has, um, contra- has, has signed a contract with NSIL Limited, which is in the way many of us look at NSIL is it is 
an extension of ISRO. It's not exactly a private, private company. To us, it's a government company. And they were given a contract of nearly 3,000 crores to build a comsat, a dedicated comsat for the Indian Army. So what that happens, when such a thing happens, and you know, if you, if you look at how uh, conflicted this procurement process is, on one hand, the government is saying they want to promote private industry. On the other hand, this contract, instead of being awarded to a truly private entity, it has been awarded to what many of us regard as a government company. Uh, now let's talk about ITAR a little bit. So I was first introduced to ITAR when I was being um, hired by then McDonnell Douglas. And by the time I started working, Boeing had acquired McDonnell Douglas and I worked for Boeing on the International Space Station program. So ITAR, I... Uh, when I researched ITAR back in the late 90s, I realized that ITAR, ITAR was set up as, um, as an export control regime to deal with the Cold War era. And if you look at ITAR in today with a lens, you know, with the 2023 lens, um, I think ITAR is completely outdated because ITAR, if it, if it, it has to be adapted to the new realities that we now inhabit geopolitically, technologically. Um, ITAR essentially means if you um, design and build an, an article in the United States and you need to take it out of the country for applications abroad or for launching on a foreign rocket, you have to go through a series of clearances in order to be able to do that. Now, if you think about it, uh, if I'm a new space company in India and I need certain components or subsystems for my satellite, for my rocket, or for any other uh, product that I might be developing, it doesn't make sense for me to buy it from the United States when it is easily available, let's say from Europe, uh, from South Africa, from China, so from other geographies, right? So I think... As far as I'm concerned, ITAR is something that the United States needs to look at very carefully and not just reform it in bits and pieces like they did during the Obama regime, where they moved certain articles from the trade department supervision to the trade department supervision. I think it needs to be overhauled. So articles which are, I mean, you know, things that are easily available in the international market should be taken off the list. There's no reason why you should keep them on the list. It's bad for American businesses too. The second thing is if, um, if a company from India wants to buy something which is on the ITAR list, um, there should be a streamlined process, which now might become possible given that the US and India are collaborating under the ICET uh, umbrella, the the initiative on critical and emerging technologies. But again, you know, what happens is the process that might evolve from our ongoing discussions might slow things down in a way that doesn't work for new companies, new space companies, because new space companies tend to be very agile, very fast in the way they move and do things. So I think I'm, I'm fairly clear of one thing that uh, not only do we need to find ways to uh, get ITAR clearances quickly for some of the components that uh, companies in India would want to use, but I think more importantly, the message here is for the U.S. government to overhaul ITAR given the new ge geopolitical realities of the world. So, Sushmita, staying on the issue of ITAR, uh, you know, I often hear this from certain stakeholders that uh, while, the while the restrictions on ITAR transfer or ITAR subject technology is very much cumbersome, at the same time, perhaps more could be done on the Indian side as well to give clarity to people who want to transfer such tech to India in terms of, for example, having a clearly laid out space policy or a space law, which has clear FDI limits in certain sectors in the space sector, uh, sub-verticals in the space sector. And also there per perhaps needs to be a discussion of the actual market readiness or market potential of the Indian companies which seek this particular technology. So do you think this is a two-way street? Do you think uh, India would also have a fair bit of heavy lifting to do when it comes to sort of doing its bit? Absolutely, absolutely, Konark. I do think it is a two-way street. 
Um, while I would like to emphasize that it's time for the U.S. government to overhaul ITAR, keeping in mind the new geopolitical realities, I think the Indian government has to do a lot more in terms of getting the policy pieces in place, in getting uh, a space legislation passed in parliament, because un until those things are done, um, the, the sort of the playing field for our new space companies and for our legacy industries, uh, not just in, in a domestic framework, but internationally, is quite sketchy. Uh, so I think I agree with you on that. But I think one needs to look at ITAR as um, also as a standalone uh, issue, because even if you take India out of the picture, I think ITAR is very limiting for American businesses because space sector, as we now know it, is not the um, uh, sort of the privilege that a few nations were indulging in in the last 50 odd years. There are a lot of new countries such as Australia, there is South Africa, there is Brazil uh, that are now starting to um, approach space, not necessarily only from a government uh, point of view, but uh, sort of encouraging private companies to start building stuff for the countries, right? So I think ITAR is um, something that doesn't make sense anymore if the kind of components and subsystems that I, as a company, am looking for is already readily available from other geographies. The other, the other thing to keep in mind is the kind of um, hurdles that one needs to overcome with ITAR uh, should be reformed in a way that you apply serious screening and clearance procedures for highly sensitive technologies such as things that go into rockets, for example. But that level of scrutiny is not necessary for a lot of other articles, which are not that sensitive in terms of defense and security uh, or from strategic, uh, for strategic reasons. So I think that's the differentiation that the ITAR uh, architects need to make or the ITAR reformers need to make. The other thing I would like to uh, bring up here is the Indo-US uh, ICET collaboration that's getting started, uh, in my view, should have happened maybe, you know, a couple of decades ago at the turn of the millennium. Uh, if you look at one of our other strategic allies, um, I'm referring to France here, France started collaborating with India um, in, in the space realm in the early 60s. And ever since, we've been steady partners and more importantly, equal partners, right? France never put out terms and conditions for this partnership. Uh, and I think the U.S. could potentially study that relationship as a case study. Um, it is ironic that what is now bringing the Uni United States and India closer is China. Um, I think United States policymakers um, need to look at the fact that in the Indian diaspora has made a huge contribution to uh, technology uh, development, to the economy of the country. So the apprehension that U.S. policymakers have had for so long in engaging with India on equal terms uh, needs a rethink, needs a reset, is what I'm trying to say. So, Sushmita, I think one of the themes which is emerging from all these answers is that, you know, it's commonplace to say that policy always trails technology. But especially in the field of space policy, it appears to be the case that space policy could certainly do with more imaginative thinking. And that brings me to my last question of this podcast, which is about Spaceport Sarabhai, your academic endeavor, which was set up in October of 2021. Could you talk a little bit more about this think tank and what it intends to do in the next coming months and years? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the space think tank, Spaceport Sarabhai, was uh, created um, because we, the co-founders, felt that this was a time when India needs to do more in terms of filling the policy void, if we are to truly make it to becoming a developed space economy. So as a think tank, we have sort of four broad goals here. 
The first one is that the initial policy documents that we saw um, that were written by the Indian government, um, they were lacking in very many ways, uh, primarily because it was scientists who were uh, asked to come together and, and write a policy document. So as a think tank, we have, uh, we have started uh, engaging researchers in uh, both management-related areas and also in technology-related areas to see how we, through our research, can inform Indian policymaking. That's number one. We are looking at areas such as uh, what kind of ecosystem advantages do space startups have in other countries? What kind of space insurance and reinsurance mechanisms do we need in India? What kind of uh, procurement um, systems overhaul should India be thinking of while writing uh, their policy framework? So these are the research questions that we are working on. The second objective as a think tank is for us to, um, to put it mildly, educate uh, our technocrats, our bureaucrats, in, our, in other words, our policymakers about international space treaties and the consequences both um, for our government program, but mainly uh, for our private sector. So we are uh, planning to um, have master classes. Um, one of the master classes will probably be in June, where we hope to invite the Ministry of External Affairs, all the relevant departments, to participate. Uh, we have also started a series of bilateral dialogues with other spacefaring countries, so an international uh, sort of con conversations. The last one was with Australia, where we looked at the legal framework. Uh, both in terms of the Moon Agreement, the Artemis Accords, and the Outer Space Treaty, how that's going to impact lunar exploration uh, in the coming years. The next uh, bilateral dialogue is with uh, Switzerland, where we will be discussing space debris um, and uh, you know, law and policy issues, even, even technology issues around what makes sense, because near-Earth space, as we all know, has become fairly dangerous in terms of uh, orbiting debris. Um, I, I think that the last and the most important contribution that we as a space think tank would like to make to the evolving uh, space scene in India is give India a legitimate, a, a well-informed international voice. What I mean by that is in the coming years, the international community is, is going to come together to think through what kind of enforceable laws need to be in place, if not laws, at least treaties, which will ensure responsible behavior uh, as we go out and develop what we are calling the low earth economy. So laws around debris mitigation, debris removal, space traffic management, space situational awareness. So I think India needs to be party to that conversation in an informed manner. And that's sort of the third angle that the space think tank uh, is, is sort of integrating into whatever we are trying to do as, as a think tank. And we are uh, putting together our website, hopefully in the next couple of months, um, you will see all of the wonderful things that we have done in our first year um, will be available for everyone to tune in, to read, um, and even interact and collaborate with us. On that note, I think we are going to close the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Mohanty, for you know, joining us for this podcast. It's been a great conversation. I think we have touched pretty much all the points, uh, such as ITAR and funding and procurement and what changes might be need to be made to India's space policy. On that note, I'll also add that Spaceport Sarabhai, I believe, has an event coming out on April 5th on orbital debris remediation. So you know, do tune in and check out their Twitter handle. And uh, I think the details are there in, on their handle. So with that, Dr. Mohanty, I'll close the podcast and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kunar. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts from. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also visit us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.